at the children of Israel coming out, God brought them out of Egypt, but did he tell them that they're going to be all by themselves? No. Did he say that this is the path I want you to take, just go in there and you're, you're off on your own? No. God said, I will make the way. I will send my angel. What does John chapter 14, verse 6 state? It's a very, very common verse. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So when we're looking at pastors and we're looking in light of Psalm 23, we see that they are the ones that go before. They are the trailblazers. They are the ones that cut back the path. They are the ones that are willing to go where no one else is willing to go. The Bible states that narrow is the way, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. So if they're going down this narrow path, it's not often trod it. So branches have to get cut back, briars need to get cut back. So the pastor is the one who is willing to go before, just as Jesus was the one who went before the church, just like he was the first one that went before the church in the death and came out in newness of life. So is the pastor to go before the sheep. He is the one that guides. He is the one that prepares the way. And when we're looking at the life of a shepherd in general, that's what the shepherd does every single day. He goes out and scouts out new territory. He sees where's the good water hole. He finds where's the good resting places. Where are the good places to eat? He prepares the way. He makes sure that it's good to go. Just as the pastor leads, the, Jesus leads the way for us, and saying he is the way, the shepherd, the pastor is the one who goes before the congregation, making sure that the way is prepared. When we're also talking about that valley of the shadow of death. We talked about how sometimes there were small narrow crevices in the mountains that the sheep and the shepherd had to pass through. So narrow and so narrow that only one sheep could pass at a time. But the shepherd still went before. Sometimes there were rock slides or slots uh, knocked down to the path that the shepherd could walk across or step across. But if your outer sheep came to it, they'd be fearful. So the shepherd went before the sheep, showing them that I'm on the other side. I made it across. You can also make it across as well. The other big thing when it comes to the valley of the shadow of death, what's the big thing about the valley of the shadow of death that we've been talking about? Is the valley of the shadow of death end of the line? No, it is not. What is one of those key words that just pop out in that phrase? What's that one? Shadow. shadow. A shadow. Can a shadow hurt you? No, we may get fearful of shadows. When we were younger, the shadows in the walls might have scared us. Might have thought that there was a monster on our bed. But when it comes to our Christian walk, he leads us in the direct path. It does not mean that we won't ever become fearful. But we need to always remember that it is not a harmful place, but it is a shadow. It cannot touch us. The other thing that we look at is when it comes to shepherd and the pastor, the sheep need to eat. If you go back to the 50s, there were that laughing spirit that caught on and it went on for weeks at some churches. But the laughing spirit is one thing. It's one thing to have the movement of the Holy Ghost. You don't need to be fed. We can't have shout down services every single week. We have to be fed. How do we get fed? With the Word of God. How does our faith increase? Faith cometh by hearing, and how does hearing come? It's not a shout out move of the Holy Ghost, but it's by the hearing of the Word of God. When it came to the Apostle Paul, he even compared preaching as foolishness, but it's still a necessity to the sheep. Because it is how we feed, it is how we grow, it is how we get nourished. And even when it comes to the shepherd, he's the one that goes before and makes sure that it is good sustenance. It is something good for us to eat. He makes sure that there is a place prepared for us. The Bible states in Psalms 23, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I've heard before that a shepherd will go into an area that is going to be a grazing area for a sheep, and he'll look for holes in the ground. And what he'll do is he'll take hot oil and he'll pour it in each one of those holes. Because each one of those holes more than likely contains a snake. Well, what will happen is as the sheep is grazing, the snake, the enemy of the sheep, may try and come up and get a hold of the sheep. 
but the oil makes it slick and they just fall right down at the holes. They don't come anywhere near those sheep. The sheep can graze in peace. They don't have to worry about anything because the shepherd has already gone and prepared the way. Now prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You realize that we are living in a very, very wicked world. One of the greatest hindrances to Bible study, I would say, is somebody who thinks that they can hop on the internet and do Bible study because you get every single thing out there on that first and it's one thing to go through a commentary that you might know is bad to say internal security or something, or even dig in the Word of God for yourself. But when you have all that, you are being bombarded with so many campaigns of the enemy, it's not even funny to try and weed through. But the shepherd is the one who's gone through. He's already studied the past. He's already prepared the sermon. He's already made sure that it was good food. And not just milk. Because milk's good for the baby, but I don't know about you. I'm not where I used to be, and I'm not a baby anymore. I want meat. So give me something with sustenance. You give me an offer who's just shallow all the time. And that'd be fine if I don't know much about the topic. But if I have to eat that every time I go to study, Brother Peter, I, I'm done. I don't want it. Push it aside. I need something with more meat. I know this stuff. i got it ingrained within my spirit. Give me something more I can munch on. That is the duty of the shepherd and the pastor to try to make sure that everyone's being fed. So he goes before us, weeds out all the bad stuff. He pours the oil in the holes where the snakes might be and gives us good food to partake with. He will also scout the area that he can see his sheep Wherever they're at, if someone would please read Psalm 139 and verse 8. Psalm 139 and verse 8. Is there anywhere we can go from the presence of God where God does not see us? There's absolutely nowhere. That is the duty of a shepherd, that he can make sure that he sees his sheep at all times, regardless of where they're at. So as he's going out and he's looking for water and holes, as he's looking for a place to graze, he's making sure that it's not just a good place that they can drink at, it's not just a good place they can feed at, but he needs to be able to see all his sheep at one time. Now we're going to change gears a little bit and we're going to start talking about the teaching aspect of it and it's going to bleed into today's lesson. So when we look at the pastor as the teacher, now remember, the pastor is to be a teacher. The office of pastor and teacher are one, but somebody can be a teacher but not a pastor. But according to scripture, a pastor is also supposed to be a teacher. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we're going. But when we're looking at that of a teacher, it comes from the Greek word that, that I'm not even going to say it, but it simply means an instructor, a master, or a teacher. It appears in 57 verses of the New Testament, and when it was translated into the English language, that Greek word was translated master, masters, doctors, teachers, and simply teacher. The majority of the time when this Greek word was used in the New Testament, it was simply translated master. And it was in reference to Jesus Christ in the four Gospels. And once again, we need to keep in mind that this is not a uh, mention of, this is not a connection to the office of just teacher itself, but rather the office of pastor and teacher are one. But when we look at that title of Master of Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament, what exactly was Jesus doing every time they referred to him as Master or Rabbi? What do you think he was doing? He was teaching. He was giving instruction. He was giving them parables trying to help them see the way that tried to give them spiritual insight so they would know the way to go. Jesus said, I am the way. But his sheep are supposed to follow in his way. It is a narrow way, but it's the one that leads to life. When we talk about the office of teacher, 
Well, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. I'm already at the page. But the pastor, teacher, the pastor needs to instruct the sheep in the way to go. He needs to make sure that he's providing good education for them. Because guess what? There are so many times we get, depending on the pastor, that we get what I call but it's like a godlike mindset. We put them up so high on a pedestal that whatever they teach is, is exactly what the Bible says. Even if there's no verses to really back it up, even if they misconstrue verses, and maybe they do it ignorantly. They do it because that's the best they can do, but the sheep still follows. The pastor is the one that needs to go before and make sure that the way is prepared accurately and because he is the one that is instructing them in every way of life. Now let's flip over to the office of teacher. Where does the office of teacher fall in the ranking of importance of offices? That is listed within uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The office of apostle is the most important office. It is first in rank. Prophets are second, and teachers become third when it comes to the lineup. Now, when it comes to the talent, one of the talents of teachers, or one of the gifts that God typically gives them, is one of being able to pull things apart and put them back together. To take scripture from here and make sure that it applies accurately over here. Not that we're making our own theology, not that we're making our own doctrine, but to lay it out, to pull the Bible apart and piece it back together. That is one of the gifts that God typically grants to the teacher. Because if you're really going to learn anything in life, somebody can tell you what something is. But if you want to know how it works, they need to be able to tell you about this piece and that piece, pull it apart, but then they also need to be able to put it back together. That is the duty, that is one of the gifts of the office of teacher, to be able to pull things apart when it comes to the scriptures and put them back together. So what is the mission of the teacher? One of the missions of the teacher is to te educate the ignorant. When we look at it, not all of us pick up on everything in life. When it comes to scriptures, not everything. We don't always pick up on everything in the scriptures. Some things we can get a hold of and we can snatch it up like this. It's ingrained in our spirit. We know exactly what it is. If we had to, we could explain it in detail to someone else. And then there's some things that they are so simple, but yet and if we have to sit there and we study and we look at it and we study and we look at it, someone else might have it like that, but for us it's a little bit hard. So the office of teacher is to educate the ignorant. And when I say ignorant, I don't mean dumb, I just mean sometimes we are ignorant about different things and we need to be instructed on them. So when it comes to the Word of God, he is the one or she is the one that helps instruct us to better understand the Word of God. Because what? Faith cometh by hearing. We want to increase our faith. We want to grow in God. We do it by the scriptures. If we want to know who God is, Jesus Christ is the word. If we really want to know who he is, we need to understand the scriptures to the best of our ability because they tell us exactly who God is. And sometimes, just sometimes, God tells us things specifically the teacher can tell us things specifically, but we just don't grasp them the way that we should. Jesus Christ's disciples, they didn't understand what seems to be the simplest of things to us. They just couldn't comprehend it. Before Christ's death, he told them on multiple, multiple occasions that he was going to die and rise again. And we can go back to his parable about, parable about destroying the temple and it'll rise again in three days. Jesus didn't do that with his disciples. They might have been there for that, but Jesus used explicit words. Basically, listen up. I'm going to die, but I will rise again in three days. I will come back to life. He told them explicitly, in detail, on more than one occasion. But did the disciples get it? No, they couldn't comprehend it. In fact, there's one point in Scripture I don't have down my notes, but it states that the disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. 
He told them in explicit detail, but they didn't get it. Sometimes we can be that way as well. And it takes that teacher through the power of the Holy Ghost because there is an anointing that comes to each office, a special anointing just for that office. And it does not just always rest upon the teacher, but that anointing flows to the congregation. It flows to the one being instructed to help them to understand. Because who is the one who is the revealer of truth? The Holy Ghost. He's the one that makes it real to us. He's the one that makes it real to our spirit. The other thing that is a duty of the teacher is to guide in the faith and truth. 1 Timothy 2, 7. Someone will please read that. 1 Timothy 2, 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and I not teacher of the Gentiles of faith and verity. So when they call, Paul call himself a teacher of the Gentiles in truth and verity. When we look at verity, it's faith. Is there any doubt in our mind that the Apostle Paul was a teacher? It really shouldn't be because we're talking about the individual who wrote the majority of the New Testament. When we look at Paul as an individual, he's the one that provided instruction and direction to many different people, individuals, and churches in general. But he called himself a teacher to the Gentiles in truth and verity. That tells us that the office of the teacher is to instruct those in faith and truth. It's great if we get somebody saved. It's great if somebody comes to the altar and gives their hearts to Christ. But is that where we leave them? If we go out and knock on our neighbor's door and they say the sinner's prayer or they come to however they come to Christ right then and there, do we just leave them there and say, well, now you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, and that's all we do? No. One of our greatest responsibilities should be at least invite them to church. At least get them somewhere that, where they can get fed, where they can grow, where they can know what truth is. Because to the individual who just finds God or is seeking for God, where are they seeking for God at? Absolutely everywhere they can. They're hungry. They're going to take everything in. I've said it before. One of the people that types of people that scare me the most are church hoppers. Because they go from denomination to denomination. Before you know that, this theology is getting mixed in with this theology. And they don't belong together because it's not part of the word of God. But because they church hop, now it's getting entwined, entwined within them, and what they believe is nothing but a hodgepodge. It's nothing in Scripture, but now it's just, well, this is what my church believes. But that is not the way that the teacher is to be. He's to instruct in truth and in faith, because truth will increase our faith in God, and will build it up, and we will have a greater relationship with God. The next thing that the teacher is to do is to guide in spiritual matters. What does Matthew chapter 8 verse 19 state? Matthew 8, 19. He instructs others in the path 
of the faith. He instructs others in the path of righteousness. He doesn't go out and say, well, you have to live like the world to win the world. But he tells them how to live in Jesus Christ. When we looked at the Apostle Paul, even far in the greater detail, one of the greatest verses that always pop out with me about the Apostle Paul is he was not one of the original twelve. He wasn't, I don't want to say he wasn't there with Christ, because when you study it out, it does appear that he would have been there at the illegal trial that took place at night because he was part of the same leader. He would have been there at the crucifixion more than likely. He would have seen Jesus in a distance, probably dying on the cross. So he would have been aware of Jesus. But when it comes to his faithfulness, it wasn't not there to the road of Damascus. But when he found Jesus, everything changed. And while he may not have been part of the original 12, he wasn't there for all of Jesus' lessons. He wasn't there for all the parables. He wasn't there for all to hear Jesus teach on this topic or that topic. But when it comes to the words of Peter, he had to step back and say, you know what, Paul, man, this bot guy, he knows the Bible. He knows the Word of God. Man, he is deep. When it comes to the things of God, sometimes he just blows my mind and it's hard to obtain what he's talking about. This is a man who found Jesus and embraced him wholeheartedly. And he said, you know what? This is the way that I need to go. And because of that, Paul instructed others in the path that they should go. He could provide insight into spiritual things. He could tell them what it's like at salvation and the hurdles they might have to go through. They could tell, he could tell them about things that were happen, going to happen and that things are going to be okay. He could direct them in the way that they should go to obtain salvation and see Jesus Christ, should they so choose. And finally, the teacher is to provide understanding and insight. We've already said sometimes spiritual truth are hard to understand. And there are some things that probably even the most scholarly individual who knows everything you can think about the Bible will say, you know what? We just won't know when we get there. Perfect example is nobody can really truly understand the Trinity and explain it in detail how the Father works with the Son and the Son with the Holy Ghost and how the three are one and this and that. No one can truly comprehend that and explain that to you in detail. Maybe there's nobody out there that can completely pull apart Jesus' humanity and his um, deity and put them together and show how they work. Just because it's so complex, because there's coming a day when we can't, when we will all know when we're changed. But there are things that, you know what, they seem a little too high for us. So the teacher breaks it down. He tries to pull it apart to his best ability and put it back together. Jesus did that because he saw those that he was teaching and he said, you know what, man, these people are carnal. If I try to tell them about spiritual things in the manner that I want to, they're never, ever, ever going to get it. So what did Jesus do? He told parables. And because of that, the master, the rabbi, the teacher was able to bring spiritual things down so that the common person could understand. Sometimes, Teachers will use parables to help those understand. Because when it comes to the office of the teacher, the office of the teacher is to help the most scholarly, when I say scholarly, the person who knows a lot about the Bible. They've been saved since the dinosaurs were on the earth. Since God brought life into existence. I used to harass the one guy, he passed away from cancer now, but I used to harass my work all the time and ask him what it was it like when God said, let there be life. But for all those people that they got a grasp of spiritual things, they need to be fed. But the common person who just comes out off the street, maybe just got saved five minutes ago, they need to be fed as well. So the teacher, through the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, needs to be able to break it down to another level. Do pastors use this technique when they're teaching? Absolutely. What does a pastor use in a sermon? He doesn't use parables, per se. We call them illustrations. We had a teacher in Bible school, Brother Heath. He would say, you need illustrations in your sermon, but your whole sermon can't be an illustration because illustrations are the windows and your sermon are the house. If you have too many windows in your house, there's going to be, it's too, it's too fragile. That's not the way I have to construct it. 
but rather a window is meant to let sunlight in. You don't want light in all the time, but some of the time. So parables and uh, illustrations are lights that teachers use to try to help us better understand spiritual truths. Now let's talk about the gifts of the teacher in closing. Each gift, as we've already mentioned, has a special anointing. God grants that individual the anointing for that office. If the teacher is anointed and allows the anointing to flow to the congregation, even the dullest of people in the congregation can have gained some truth during that. When it comes to the anointing, the speaker, uh, the holy, the preacher, teacher, whoever it might be, the Holy Ghost can anoint them, but they also have the option to allow the anointing to flow to the congregation as well. The anointing is what makes the difference when you're sitting out there and the sermon or the teaching, hopefully like this morning, seems like the preacher or the teacher's been going on for hours, but yet it's only the minutes. It's the anointing that makes time seem irrelevant because the Holy Ghost has just been ministering and you've been gleaning so much. That is the anointing flowing to the congregation. It is that pastor or preacher who's getting up and preaching that seems like, man, he went for three hours, but man, I could listen to him all night long. That's what makes a difference. The anointing allows the congregation to clean if the individual allows it to flow to them. The student can be sucked into whatever is being taught, even if it's the dull, it seems like it's the dullest of subjects typically. For some people, the tabernacle is not the most exciting topic. You get to preaching on certain aspects, and the Holy Ghost gets in it, man, it can get exciting. But to sit down, to study it, and this color represents this color, and this, this metal represents this, it can get dull. Or as Sister Beth likes to say, God wanted us to know, He would have just told us right now. Not everything has to be a symbol. But it's the anointing that changes all of that. It's what makes the difference. The student can receive greater insight. Because it's the same way when we're reading the Word of God. What makes the, Holy, makes the Bible alive to us? It's the Holy Ghost speaking to our spirit. That's what makes the Word of God alive to us, and the Holy Ghost is that anointing that makes the topic real to us, and just get that we just get so sucked into whatever's being taught or preached. And once again, just because it's a teaching, I should say once again, but just because it's a teaching session, if the Holy Ghost is in it, that doesn't mean that the gifts can't be in operation. Typically, we see it during worship service. Maybe while the pastor is preaching, but just because teaching is being done does not mean that the Holy Ghost does not want to speak at times and bring out other things as well, or speak to individual lives. Sister Beth was telling me of an individual that taught at her own church that there were tongues, there were interpret um, interpretation, prophecy, all that was being given in his Sunday school classes as he was teaching, just as much, if not more, during normal service. Why? Because the Holy Ghost, when He gets in something, He's the one that makes it real. He's the one that brings it into our spirit and feeds us and makes it just so real to our lives. The other gift of the teacher is to make the topic apply to our lives on an individual basis. It's one thing to understand the Word of God and to understand this great truth. We can understand that the rapture is going to happen at any moment. We can understand that Jesus Christ is not coming back completely at that point, that the church is going to be called up to meet him in the air. But what does that do for us now? It's the teacher that goes before and shows us that we may be living right every single moment of every single day. Because otherwise, guess what? Just because you go to church does not mean you're going to make the rapture. It's the teacher that makes us aware that we need to be living every single day. That God does not have a Sunday school attendance book or a church attendance book right next to the book of life and saying, well, you did this evil thing over here. 
But you got five gold stars for going to Sunday school five weeks in a row. You know, that's not the way it works. He is the one who brings the truth to light, but also brings it down to a level where we can apply it to our own life and that we can understand it and make it real in our own life that we are living it day in and day out. And finally, as I've already said, the other final gift I see of the teacher is the ability to take spiritual truths, the ability to take the scriptures, pull them completely apart, separate them, but yet be able to put them right back together and connect them. Because really, when we look at the Word of God, prophecy is a great thing. Is all of prophecy contained in one little passage or one little chapter? No, it's not. If we look at prophecies concerning just the birth, life of Jesus Christ, are they all contained in one chapter? No, they're spread out. And sometimes if you don't know what we're looking for, it doesn't always jump out. We could be reading the Psalms and read the verse where a bone of him is not broken and not realize that's speaking of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. The teacher is the one who takes the scriptures, pulls them apart, but is also able to put them back together again. Because what is an individual who creates something or understands how something functions? You can understand a motor and pull it apart, but if you can't put it back together the way it came out, the way it's supposed to go, that motor's never going to work. The same thing is true with spiritual truth. The teacher needs to be able to separate the scriptures and put them back together. Otherwise, all we have is a bunch of heresy and mysteries. They need to go back to the scripture, goes back perfectly if we understand the word of God. The Bible is clear. We need to study to show ourselves approved of the God. That's a command for every single one of us. The teacher is the one who helps us on our path. But we're the ones that still need to be sitting in the pews saying, if somebody gets up to teach and say, you know what? That's not right. That's not right. Maybe it was intentional or the last heresy. You know what? That's, that's not right. Maybe it was unintentional. All of us are preachers. Every single one of us are guilty in this room. At some point in, the, in our lives, we got up and we preached something that Moses led the animals onto the ark. Just something stupid. We study so we know that things happen. But the teacher is the one who helps us along the way. But we all need to study and show ourselves proof of the God. A work man that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Anybody got any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? If not, We'll wrap up, we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth. The Holy Ghost may move, having his way as he so desires for. I pray that you anoint the speaker today, and anoint his, anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your word. I pray, Lord, that you would give him a special blessing, and anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal force, Lord. Give them a special blessing as well, Lord. And anoint our minds and our hearts that they would be good soil for your word to follow, on, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. That we 